Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We are reading the entire Bible together, book by book, chapter by chapter. We're looking at Zechariah chapter 9 today. This is a chapter that, well, at least maybe a part of it might sound a little bit familiar to some of you. Uh, once we get to verse 9 anyway, it is actually something we have uh, in the lectionary co commonly used for uh, Passion Sunday, Palm Sunday, right? Uh, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. Here, here it is. So uh, it, it's a passage that pops up in the New Testament in really big ways, but here we're reading it in the context of Zechariah, all the visions we've seen, all this stuff about um, Gaza and Ekron and Ashdod and Philistia in the first part of chapter 9. So here we're putting the pieces together. So really looking forward to, to seeing how this all works out in this context. And today joining us, we have one of our regular guests. We've got Pastor John Lekumski from Southern Illinois here in the studio with us today. Good morning, brother. So good to have you again with us. Yeah, good to be back. And, and you know, it is it is strange, AJ. So like you said, Zachariah 9, the whole business about the uh, uh, triumphal entry. Yeah, know that well. I've done that year in and year out. Uh, yeah. Rejoice, O great, uh, greatly, O daughter of Zion. But to be honest with you, this is a little true confession here. I had never, ever read it in the entire context of Zechariah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's just something that you that we very often just don't do, you know. When we have our, our our daily readings and our weekly readings, right? And no, you know, yeah. it's it's not it's not bad to read the Bible that way. It's certainly <laughs> a good practice, but yeah. it's just the 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 danger is that yeah, it's it's just really easy to. I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure how many times I had ever uh, done that before. I mean, it's just um, it, it's really something though when you do try to see how it fits together, you're like, oh, I didn't even think about reading it that way. <laughs> well, well, and the thing is, is when you read the entirety of the chapter, you can see why they chose that set of verses. Of course, as you said, because it is a, 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 it's the one part of the chapter that the New Testament tells us what it's all about, what it's talking about. But, you know, the verses before it, I understand them. They're pretty clear, and yet they're really not all that pleasant. <laughs> and yeah. then the verses after it, when we get to that, I'm even scratching my head and saying, I'm not sure what that vision is supposed to be telling me. So uh, it's a good thing we got the stuff in the middle that is pretty clear and pretty understandable. <laughs> thanks. Thanks to the comments of the New Testament. Yeah. Right, right. But, but but we won't just uh, spend all our time on the middle so that no, we don't we look at the stuff at the end. We're going to we're going to get there by by God's grace. So <laughs> let's let's go ahead and get into the text then. As we do so, would you say a prayer for us and for everyone listening along today? All right, alert. So here's here's the honest God's truth. Uh, uh we come to these prophets and we don't always know exactly what they're talking about. We're, we're not sure whether they're addressing situations that are happening right then and there, or whether they're addressing situations that are happening in our life, or maybe they're even addressing situations that haven't even taken place yet. And so sometimes we are befuddled. We thank you, though, that you have given us the insights of the New Testament authors who have pulled the things out, the things you've promised. Uh, and we pray, O oh Lord, now as we do this Bible study, AJ and I, that you would help us remember what Jesus said, that these scriptures are all about him. He said, you search the scriptures and they're all about me. So, so help us to, to find the comforting truths about Jesus and about our life here and now that you would give us in Zechariah 9. We really do need your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. All right. Let's go ahead and just, well, <clears throat> I mean, let, let's look at the first part here. Uh, but we, we don't want to really read too far because we do want to try to, like you were saying, it, it's going to be a little bit difficult to see how these pieces all fit together, especially with the first and the last parts. So we don't want to be forgetting what we looked at last time. So let, let's just read just, say, the first four verses and then just stop and say, okay, now, looking at this first part, wh why is that coming to us? after everything that we saw in Zechariah 8 last time. And, and maybe the stuff in Zechariah 8 is going to help us out today. So let, let's let's try it out, just the first four verses, and then okay. if you could I, I, just I'm, I'm break actually, it down. Hey, Jim, I'm actually going to do and I, I, won't, I won't, I know we got to get through the chapter, but I'm going to ask you to just read the first few words of chapter 9. 
because there's a very important word there I want to talk a little bit about, and then, then we can go ahead and do the first four verses and do the things you said, if you don't uh, mind. You want to talk about the word oracle? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, well, 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 let's... um. <clears throat> Yeah, no, that, that that's fine. Why don't we go ahead and just I'll just read the that that first introductory part, and then sure we we can talk a little bit about Oracle, and, okay. and we've talked about it here and there, but I don't think we've talked about this particular Oracle word in a little bit. So I, okay. I think it's a good refresher. So here's Zechariah chapter nine, just the first part of the first verse. The Oracle of the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach. Okay. So yeah, um, I, I think what you're anticipating, what I'm anticipating here is that you're pointing out that this is not this. I, I mean, we're very used to seeing um, the or, oracle of the Lord, oracle of the Lord through a lot of these prophecies in, in the Hebrew. That's naum, but this is a different word. It reminds us of something we saw back in Numbers. Right, right. Uh, and what, what what's a fascinating word is because the root of this word. And, 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 you know, I would complain about the Hebrew, except the English does that, too. Uh, in fact, we, we have a term for a word that can actually mean two different things. <laughs> and I'm sorry, yeah. I can't give you an example right now, but there are plenty of English words that in one context would mean one thing. You put another context, and it might even mean what would seem to be the antonym, the opposite. But, but sure. see, that's the problem with this word oracle. It, 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 honest to God, you're, you're the linguist, okay? <laughs> and I will defer to you. Usually context determines, right? So pretty yeah. much we know this is an oracle. That's what we have. That's what it sure. means. But it is fascinating that the root of this word can also mean a burden, but it's also the word that's used to lift something up, even, even in some contexts to forgive. And I just mm -hmm. thought that was a cool way to begin the oracle of the word of the Lord. So when the word of the Lord comes to you, it could be a burden. <laughs> it could be mm -hmm. a thing that will make you feel really weighted down with guilt. On the other hand, it could be a thing that might lift you up. In fact, indeed, bring you forgiveness. And in the context of this chapter, I thought this is the perfect word to begin what is going out here. Because it starts off as a horrible burden. Trust me, if you live in the land of Hadrach and Damascus... <laughs> You ain't going to want to hear this oracle. And yet, as right. we'll see in the middle, there's this beautiful, beautiful promise that's being made even to the people of Hadrach and Damascus, which is what's so striking. Oh, well, anyway, so I just wanted to make that brief yeah. comment about the word oracle. Yeah, 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 yeah thanks. No, it's, um, you're right. I mean, it's one of these, di there's a balance, right? Like, on yeah. the one hand, you, you can't go and, and split hairs to the point of saying like, oh, well, you know, like, because it's this word and not the other one, like, it's it's something that's totally different. And, um, you know, and oh, because this word's related to that word. I mean, I was just, um, in fact, we were doing a, a Bible study just, uh, just, what was it, like yesterday. And uh, I was talking about, you know, hey, if you like go really hardcore into etymologies, you know, uh, the English word silly comes from a word for bless, right? But I'm pretty sure that, you know, when uh, the tricks rabbit gets told silly rabbit tricks over kids, <laughs> they're not saying, oh, most blessed, you know, r rabbit. I don't think that's. Oh, the yes, meme, they right? are, just to, AJ. Just, well, now I'm going to well, take no, the no, other that, position that really, on that. Really I know we debate that in the church. <laughs> it, it's the etymology. It has to yeah, be that. Yeah, right. So, yeah. yeah, no. So or, or um, you know, like when when someone asks, like, would you would you say the blessing, right? Well, I mean, the word for blessing in English comes from the word, same root for the word blood, yeah. right? But I don't think they're saying like, you know, sprinkle sacrificial blood over the Thanksgiving turkey, right? So it, it's one of those things, as you were saying, you can't get too hung up on what a word's related to or else you could get really thrown off on the wrong track. But you don't want to just ignore that it is actually a different word here than, than the other ones that we see. And, um, you know, and I think as we as I think back on the last several months of thy strong word, we saw this word back when we were looking at Isaiah. Um, there was that kind of uh, <laughs> the lost chapters, as we were calling them, and we had an oracle concerning Moab and an oracle concerning Damascus and concerning Egypt, uh, all generally um, fairly uh, judgment-ish, <laughs> put it that, that way. Um you know, and, uh, and, and yet there, there was, there was more to it though. And we saw, um, for instance, like back in like Isaiah chapter 19, there's like a, I mean, my goodness, we had that, that scandalous statement, blessed be Egypt, my people yeah. and yeah. Assyria, the work of my hands. So, uh, you can't say that this word, I mean, it's a different kind of Oracle word. Um, maybe it's a burden and you might want to say like, okay, it's like burden in the sense of like, you know, it's a bad thing. Well, clearly not all the time. Sometimes it's actually kind of 
kind of kind of good. And and we saw that even in numbers, how when Balaam was um, supposed to be cursing, right, the people of God, he he. Uh, this is the word that's used. This masha, uh, this Hebrew word, um, and he couldn't help but bless God's people. So. Yeah, so uh, I, I think that's um, that's actually to the ESV's credit. They actually updated their translation in uh, 2011, and they actually changed it from burden to oracle. And I, I think it's probably right that they did that because burden can sound unnecessarily negative. It's not necessarily the 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 point, as you said. It could just be something you lift up in terms of especially lifting up your voice to make. A pronouncement, and so I, I think maybe the idea has more to do with this is a sure and certain thing. It's being declared. Um, it's going to happen, and, and that's maybe a little bit more of the sense than necessarily something like negative or bad or something. Two two things though. Two two things. Number one, uh, yeah, you're right. Sometimes we got to be really careful when we start nitpicking about words. But but it always strikes me as interesting if an author chooses a different word. I think it's worth trying to explore that. Why did he choose that word? Right. Uh, right. The problem is, like you said, sometimes we don't. Uh, people don't understand. There's not a there's not a Hebrew dictionary that tells us what all words mean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, in fact, there is no dictionary like that. Basically, what dictionaries do is they take they take the things in context, and I say, okay, here's what we're seeing people using right. it. And since we have right. only limited usage, that's sometimes. But see, now I'm thinking of every example that you've given, and I'm yep. thinking there is something special. You, you use this word when you're going to give something that is a thing of judgment. But again, the judgment of God, and I hope everyone understands this. If God comes and judges you, and He may be coming, me may be coming to our listeners and judging them. But there's always a good thing for judgment. It is not His intention to destroy. It would seem that way when you read the opening verses here that he's just out to just demolish all these people. And yet, as you, you indicated in these other texts, there's all this little thing, no, no, no. He, he's only judging them because actually he wants to restore them. He wants them to be part of his people. In fact, why would he? But but no, somehow there wants to be a redemption even in those people that we would just eliminate and be done with. Uh, so I, I don't know. That, I, should Someone should do a word study on this particular word and see if that isn't. But the examples you gave all seem to fit yeah. that, don't, don't they? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, um, yeah, you know, even in, like, for instance, I was mentioning, like, Isaiah 19. Like, I mean, there is some kind of judgment that, that Egypt undergoes first before they are blessed ultimately. Um, I mean, when we when we consider, you know, back in numbers, though, like those those numbers um, oracles of Balaam when he was blessing the people of God, I I guess I don't know to what extent, like how how much kind of judgment there. Right? Numbers was already a little bit ago, but yeah, yeah I think you're, to your to your point though, I mean, it really is just. Um, I mean, it's certainly worth looking at it. You don't want to skip over the fact and just say, oh, it doesn't matter and. You know, it's it's they're all basically the same, and so it's just kind of random which one pops out. Like, no, I don't. You know, we don't want to say that. <laughs> like, it just doesn't matter which which word got picked here. I mean, it's scripture here, right? So we 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 want to like pay attention. Um, but yeah, I think I think that you know uh, what you suggested. I think it's certainly fair enough that if it does mean oracle in some kind of a bird in some sense, it's only in a bird in some sense that isn't limited to being purely negative. Like, yeah, like there's, yeah. there, there, there can be more to the story. In fact, there, there certainly is more to it. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that's fair. All right. Um, so thank you for, so, okay. you know, letting me, because I, I just, I thought that's <laughs> yeah, a cool yeah. one. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 you bet. Go ahead, you bet. go ahead. But, but, yeah. but you're, you're not, you're not going to stop us from getting to the end. No, now, no, no, we can't. won't. <laughs> we, we can move on. <laughs> okay. So continuing on then, <clears throat> so he's, that's the middle of, uh, verse one. So we mentioned the land of Hadrach. Okay, going on. And Damascus is its resting place, for the Lord has an eye on mankind and on the tribes of Israel, and on Hamath also, which borders on it. Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise, Tyre has built herself a rampart and heaped up silver like dust and fine gold like the mud of the streets. And behold, the Lord will strip her of her possessions and strike down her power on the sea, and she shall be devoured by fire. All right. So a lot of place names here. Um, some of these probably sound familiar from when we were going through Joshua, um, Tyre and Sidon. We know up in the north that we're talking about, I mean, that would have been Asher's uh, territory, um, you know, the way the way of the sea up north by um, also Naphtali and Zebulun, right? 
So um, these these places that and we we I think we talked about this a little bit too. Just you know, like these um you know just wealthy wealthy places because of all the trade that they did. These these coastal cities with their ports. Um, but some of the other names maybe are less familiar, especially like you know Hadra, Hamath. Um, so help kind of orient us here. <laughs> Wait, wait a second! Didn't didn't, huh. didn't you read my contract, AJ? I do not answer. <laughs> I do not answer geography questions. <laughs> I'm oh, an American. Dear. I do not need to know geography. Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh, no. <laughs> well, so yeah, obviously, know, you're asking these questions. So honestly, I I don't know what is significant about Hadrash. Uh, I know what Damascus is. Uh, I know that all of these cities are very great and powerful cities who would feel that, you know, we're pretty much calling the shots here. But yeah. is there something special about the land of uh, Hadrash? Oh, I mean, that one in particular. Well, I mean, I think we're going to see this. Maybe um, if we don't want to talk too much specifically about some of these, uh, it might actually help if we go ahead and keep reading yeah. here. Because if do... you go through verse 8, I think there's a pattern with all these place names. And well, I think we don't want to miss the forest for the trees here on this. Okay, well, so, well, so, so let me make this brief comment, though, since we've yeah. stopped here. So so the main thing is we're talking about the, the cities up north, the prominent cities up north. Uh, yeah. and, and God is clearly saying, look, I, I'm calling the shots. And we need to remember that, too. We, we worry about Russia and Iran and all that stuff. And we need, Hey, it's all in God's hands. Seriously, he's controlling us, too. We don't like to think that. We like to think we're good Americans. We do what we want to do at no, no, We're just his instrument and his tool in America, no different than any other nation. But just so anyway, we've got these cities up in the north, and now in these next verses— they see what happens, the, the cities down south see what happens in cities in the north, and they get nervous. Isn't that the impression you get here? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think so. It's, it's meant to be kind of a, you know, this is just one of these A to Z moves, Alpha Omega, to describe kind of the whole range of it. And so, I mean, as far as I'm aware, like like Hydrock is like, I think that was like a, a capital um, in, in, in Leish, which is uh, that city that Dan eventually captures mm -hmm. way up, way up north. Yeah. Um, so yeah, all this stuff is the northern stuff, if, if I'm or orienting things the right way. But now we're going to go down south. Yeah. So, and and, uh, and right away, it says the people down south, are, they're afraid too. They've seen what's going yes. on. And, yeah, okay. So. All right. So here we are picking up at verse 5 then. Ashkelon shall see it and be afraid. Gaza too, and shall writhe in anguish. Ekron also, because its hopes are confounded. The king shall perish from Gaza. Ashkelon shall be uninhabited. A mixed people shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of Philistia. I will take away its blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth. It too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be like a clan in Judah, and Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. Then I will encamp at my house as a guard, so that none shall march to and fro. No oppressor shall again march over them, for now I see with my own eyes. Which is how the whole thing started, for the Lord has an eye on mankind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, well, no, very, very good. And so, and the eyes have been, um, I mean, we keep seeing that again and again, right? Like all this, I'm um, lift up my eyes and, and seeing with all these visions, right? And then I think we talked about, didn't didn't we have the the, the apple of his eye, the, oh, the pupil we did. of his eye stuff we did. back That's in Zechariah right. chapter, yeah. Man. Was chapter yeah. two, was it four or five? Oh, it seems like um, ages ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but so yeah, this eye language just keeps um, popping up, both in terms of the eyes of the prophet, but also the eyes of of God and, and what is he looking at and what is he going to do about this stuff? And as you were pointing at earlier already, the, these cities aren't, I mean, so they're the cities that are up North that are like along the Northern boundary. And then these cities, well, these aren't necessarily the cities that are like way down South. Like this isn't like Edom, like way down no, South, like no. South of like the, the Dead Sea or anything, but this is, um, you know, the, the Southern um, and coastal area, uh, that would have been just south of of Dan. Well, actually, technically, as we saw in Joshua, including cities that Dan was supposed to take, but never really could, yep. Yep. right? And, so, and I think this is like a big thing because you know even Tyre and Sidon, it's yeah, that was actually a part of Asher's inheritance, but it's questionable to what extent Asher ever really took Tyre and Sidon. I mean, you see, you know, at least in Judges, like maybe there was like a, a brief fleeting time where. Like, okay, we, like we took those, but I mean, uh, how long did that last? These are extremely powerful cities 
that just seem to be these enemies in in the side of God's people that just that you can never get rid of these guys, whether it's you know the, these Philistines in, in the south um, southwest or it's uh, these powerful cities up north. But the description here, right, is they're going to be wiped out. It's going to be like the Jebusites, the people who used to inhabit Jerusalem and who were totally um, demolished, right? Like these guys are going to get taken care of. And yet what's what's striking. So 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 see, that's the part I think that's really clear that, that you've got all these. And, and, and obviously the paganism is emphasized in the the mixed people. Uh, yeah. The abominations uh, between its mouth, the blood from its mouth, you know, all these these uh, foreign I- idolatry and and uh, wicked uh, sacrifices and all that, and, and so God saying, eh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring an end to all of that. Don't worry about that. Uh, they may be sitting cocky now, you know, with their what was that the dust of the heaped up silver like dust, and they've got their ramparts not, and fine gold. I'm I, I'm gonna take care of all of that. But doesn't that strike you? Then he says. It too shall be a remnant for our God, but mm-hmm. but no, I'm not destroying them to destroy them. I'm destroying them because of their evil, sinful practices, this idolatry, but only so that I can bring them back. And, and now, AJ, you're making me think it was always His intent to have these people. It was the failure of His His Israelites to do what they were told to do, to take over and and to make this part of the kingdom of Israel. That that was the fault. But it was God's intent always that these people would be uh, amongst. Uh, the people he would call his own. Uh, and, and when you read yeah. that and then you see this, that they're going to be like a remnant. What? Why? Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's the, that's the whole emphasis. And then we, then it really fits in nextly to what he's going to do. Uh, that passage that we all know so familiar. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. It is really something to connect the dots and, and like, you know, like you were saying, consider like, okay, so why is this having to get addressed now? Right. Because, well, because yeah, it didn't happen back in Joshua. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, I mean, it is, it is a challenge because, you know, on, on the one hand, um, you know, this language of here of like being a, a remnant and, and, and like a clan in Judah, I mean, that, that does, when you read it, it can kind of sound like, you know, uh, like maybe, you know, there's going to be some part of them that's spared um, and then incorporated into God's people. Though, I mean, I don't know, the mention of the Jebusites. Yeah, yep. see, that's a different, yeah, that's a different image there, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, like, you know, just they're, they're it, you know, it kind of feels a little, and especially when you look at like the background of like Joshua, um, you know, you know the, the the ban, right, the, this, uh, as it's called sometimes, it, it did not allow for there to be uh, surrender, any surrendering cities when it came to the land that was to the west of the Jordan. They could do that to the east of the Jordan. If a, if a city surrendered, they could just capture it and the, and the people could um, be, I mean, I mean, incorporated into things somehow. But when it came to the western uh, side of the river, it was it was just total, you know, just no, you, you don't make deals. You don't, uh, you know, uh, kind of go halfway. So, I mean, it really is, uh, as you were starting to get it to, it starts to really kind of raise a whole bunch of questions here because hang on a second, like they were supposed to just wipe out um, these cities, not uh, make deals with them. Um, and here they're supposed to be like defeated and, and like brought in somehow. And then, and then of course it's, it's just kind of a question like to, to what extent does that historically even happen? So there's kind of a bunch of question marks that get raised when you start looking at this stuff. So, so this, so the historical reference that, that I saw in several commentaries is that this is Alexander the Great coming down with the great, you know, Grecian empire. And, and he literally does. He, all of these nations fall in, in sequence uh, like you said, though, I don't know. I, I, I get a little bit troubled sometimes trying to do a one-on-one identification. These are difficult prophecies. That, that, that could be. Um, but for me, when, when I'm reading this and I'm trying to think, what am I trying to bring to people? What might God be saying to people? You're right. There can't be syncretism. I mean, that's where we want to go. We say, oh, well, we can coexist. No, there, there's no coexistence between Christianity and other religions. It's not that we think we're a better religion than other religions. It's just that every other religion is is teaching you that you got to get it done by your works. Every other religion is is telling you it's all about you and what you do, and, and Christianity is the only religion. No, it's all about God. He's the one in charge. He's the one in control. You want to be saved? You you got to turn to the Lord because there's no other way you're going to do it. 
Uh, so you can see it, it, that's black and white. There, there's no way you can join those two things together, uh, although right. we try, don't we? I, I'll do half the yeah. work. God can do the other half. <laughs> but well, no, or, or, that or, just, or as you were saying, just yeah. to kind of, I mean, co- coexist it is, uh, I mean, very, very seldom just coexist. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 yeah. it's more, as you were saying, it's actually just uh, a kind of a, a nicer word for, for syncretism. And that's clearly not what's not in view. Yep. When, in verse said it, verse seven, it says, I will take away its blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth. I mean, that seems to be some kind of an allusion to how, I mean, the, these other peoples, especially in Philistia, I mean, they offered all kinds of terrible sorts of yeah. sacrifices. Um, I mean, that may have included, you know, even, you know, humans or even children in particular, You've got, you know, the uh, just the eating of of the blood, which or or the unclean animals, which would have um, been something that was uh, against what had been given through Moses. And so it's not at all like a description of like, oh, well, you know, just they're okay too, and like they're yeah. every, just everybody's God's people, all right? You know, like just you know all that stuff back in Joshua. You know, forget about it. Like, no, 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 no. So yeah, it's definitely not. It's not syncretism. And if there is any kind of a sense here where, okay, well, maybe they don't have to be wiped out and there's some kind of mercy, um, the mercy doesn't negate that everyone needs repentance. And, and it's not really mercy if there's no repentance there, because then you're just letting people, you're giving them over to the darkness that, that has hold of all of us outside of God's mercy. So we got to take our break here, but I I do want to give you a chance to kind of develop this a little bit more. Uh, But then we'll get back to the second half of Zechariah chapter nine. When we get back here on Thy strong word, be right back. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're looking at Zechariah chapter 9. Uh, as we were saying, a chapter that has a, a very uh, familiar part, you know, that we hear read on Palm Sunday, right? But you look at this context here, and you're looking at, you know, these ancient cities, um, this description of um, a military defeat and destruction of some kind, like, now, hang on, how do we connect these dots? And helping us today to connect. Then we've got Pastor John Lekumsky from Southern Illinois in the studio with us. I want to make sure before I uh, turn it back to you to kind of flesh this out a little bit more, what we were just talking about, um, thank our underwriters at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Check them out at lhfmissions.org. Thank you guys for your support of what we're doing here. So yes, in Zechariah chapter nine, um, yeah, I think that what you had just mentioned that when you try to look at what is all this talking about literally, well, yeah, you know, it's and this is something that you do see in the commentaries that it's true that when Alexander the Great comes by, um, you know, these these people get defeated, uh, if for no other reason because everybody gets defeated when Alexander the Great comes by, <laughs> I mean, except without exception, except for Jerusalem and the Temple. Well, that that gets spared, you know. Well, well which is is a striking thing. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that, we got we got to clarify. I mean, defeat, right, does not necessarily mean you know, uh, you know, slash and burn everything yeah. to the ground, yeah. right? I mean, and, yeah. and, and we saw this, and of course, in in Isaiah, and um, and even really when we were kind of talking about this with our our kind of latter prophets stuff with Ezra, Daniel, et cetera, that when, you know, Persia came by, he didn't, you know, level Babylon to the ground. He kind of waltzed in because yeah. they they knew that uh, he had their number. So, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, everyone gets defeated. That doesn't necessarily mean it's all, you know, demolished. But yeah, so that is one thing that people do in the commentaries say like, well, may- maybe this is looking ahead to 
Alexander the Great. And I mean, I think that's something that people think about too. If we remember all the way back to Zechariah chapter one, um, there was the description of the four horns. And there are some people that connect those horns, right? Because there's, there's horns mentioned also in Daniel we saw, right? And so are, are those like the four empires? Like we're talking about, you know, back in Daniel, um, it was, we, we had Babylon um, and then we had Persia. And then uh, this is where it gets kind of messy. Um, then the Macedonian Empire of Alexander the Great. And then some people would say Rome, or, you know, I might suggest it's the Seleucids who came after him. Uh, but, you know, some people connect it there. So it's a real question about just how far Zechariah is looking into the future. Exactly, exactly. And and I'll be honest with you, AJ, I frankly don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no, no. I, I, know, <laughs> I, mean, I, I know you're speaking in hyperbole <laughs> there because it's not that we don't care. It's well, no, I didn't, I, say, I, I didn't say people didn't care. I said I don't care. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, God. Well, no, well, no my point I, is, is so whether yes. it was Alexander the Great or not, or whether there's some other yeah. things going on here, whether the four horns were the four empires, uh, the point is, is so so what is the Holy Spirit, what's the message he's trying to bring to me? And, and I think the message is, is as you already highlighted, no syncretism. I'm sorry, we cannot coexist. And that sounds like a good thing, but it can't happen because uh, this is totally opposed to what I want to give my people. And they're just going to mislead you. You're not going to coexist with them. You'll end up doing things the way they do them. Although, you know what's really crazy, and, and you, you're, you're mm. responsible for this. I had not put the focus on there about the blood. I'll take away the blood from the mouth. It's abomination mm. from between its teeth. And as you related yeah. to that, boy, boy, if you were a Jew, that was the worst thing you could do is to drink blood. That was one of the big commandments, along right. with the, God is one. And, and yet then in the New Testament, Jesus says, take drink, this is my blood. And of course, the, you know, Peter sees this vision of all these unclean animals, and God says, go right. ahead and take, I, oh, I can't eat those. No, I'm telling you, you can. And I'm thinking yeah. that's here. I think it's God saying, no, 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 we cannot tolerate anything other than belief in me. There is only one God to fear, love, and trust. But you've got to understand, that's not because I hate these people and want to destroy these people though no, it's because i want them to be made my people too and now let me tell you what i'm going to do and i'm not just going to do it for you in fact you're going to reject it you're going to reject it when i do this thing but no i'm doing this for you and for all nations and in time you you will understand that although you won't understand it when it actually happens uh, alluding right, right. now to the next verses yeah yeah okay let's go ahead and read this this middle section here then starting at verse nine Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Could 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 we just stop there, AJ? Could we just stop sure. there? Because so so you've got the whole Jewish thing. You you've got the northern kingdom Ephraim. You you've got yes. the southern kingdom Jerusalem. And yet, mm -hmm. when you're reading through this, the striking thing is he says, "I'm not stopping there. No, no, I want to speak peace to the nations. My rule is going to be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth." You guys always thought it was about just your little tribal kingdom. You thought that was the pro, but you should have been paying attention. I told Abraham he, through him, would be a blessing to all nations. That was always the plan. And if I told right. you to go and destroy a people, it wasn't because I wanted to destroy people. It was because I knew there would never be any repentance there. Those people would never, ever want to come and, and come and, and, and conform and be part of, of my— they would simply bring evil and mislead. But no, no, I never wanted to just wipe out everybody until all that was left was, was the Israelites. That was never the plan. Right. Well, right. And, well, and to, to that point, right, I mean, we remember the how, how back in Joshua, which we, you know, didn't read that long ago, we had that description of how they were scared of these chariots and these war horses, yes. right? Um, and, and that was like a real, a real, I mean, you know, we remember it was the tribe of Joseph, especially because um, they, they, they kind of just decided to go hide up in the hill country because they didn't want to go down um, out of the hills where there's all these war horses and chariots run, running around. Uh, but you know what, what Joshua says is, Hey, look, um, you know, have faith God, you know, if you, if you do, God will, you know, even defeat these. But the description, right. Is that 
they weren't going to just be like, oh, hey, this, this is a really sweet saddle. And, you know, like, hey, let's take these horses. And like, this chariot's pretty cool. Let, hey, now we get to ride around the chariot. Look at me, mom. No, no hands, right? Um, like the, the point was not that they, they would just kind of take over that stuff and be, be the new, you know, uh, guys on the chariots and the horses. But they actually were supposed to destroy the chariots and the horses because they weren't supposed to be that kind of people. They weren't supposed to be the kind of people that um, was all about war. Um, which was pretty much just everybody at the time. Um, so, so you see that kind of consistency that you know, the, the goal was never that we were going to be, you know, this little kingdom and we would just kind of beat everybody at their own game, <laughs> but that we would be something different. And that, you know, th this, this idea of here's, here's, here comes the, the, it's, it's really kind of an interesting thing. On the one hand, by putting verse nine in the context of all the destruction, yeah, um, yeah, the, the the clear, I think, local implication, how you would have taken it if you were hearing um, Zechariah say all this, um, you know, as he says, you know, back in um, where was it? Back in chapter seven, in the fourth year of King Darius, right? Um, if you were hearing him say that, you would very naturally assume that this Messiah is the one who destroyed. Um, the both these guys up in the north and with Tyre and Sidon, and also the Philistines down south with Gaza and Ashdod and Philistia, and he's coming back into the city victorious. That that's that's I think like just the very natural way that you would read this. And yet, the idea is he's done this, but he hasn't done it so we can just you know just be the warlords of the earth. But he's done it so that we can stop and put all that stuff away, beat the swords into plowshares and have peace among all the nations. And, and AJ, thank you that you have expressed it so beautifully, and that is exactly the point. Uh, and, and as Christians, we need to remember that we, we are not the war horse. It is our, not our job to conquer all lands and make them Christian countries. It, it is our job to bring shalom, to bring peace, to bring God's gospel and forgiveness. And therefore, we really need to love all those Iranians it's so easy to say, oh, let's just, oh, they need to be, God needs to destroy. And you know, the thing is, God is going to destroy all nations. Isn't that the history? Take the Roman Empire, take, take uh, you know, take uh, Hitler, take take communism. When, when will it come to us? It, it'll come to us, to every great empire, the, the, the uh, Britain. All these earthly empires are going to come to an end. But Christianity, we're into something far greater than that. We want this sea to sea peace that's talked about here from the rivers and the ends of the earth. Isn't that what he said? My gospel will go out and, and there won't be any until yeah. it's preached on the ends of the earth. Well, uh, and, 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 and the meek um, shall inherit the yeah, earth. Yeah, right? exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Well, well let's, let's go ahead and finish out this section here. But, I think, I think but, just... I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, AJ. <laughs> I know you've got an assignment, but I just have to comment on the word humble here because I, I, okay. I did a word study and, and it's not what okay. I, I, I thought it meant that you would be a, a humility, kind of a thing of uh -huh. the heart. But uh -huh. but it's actually that that word no it it means that you've got a burden you've got a trial you've got a problem it's used it's used of Joseph when he was sold off in slavery it's used of of what the Israelites experienced in the wilderness uh, so so when we're talking about this king coming in humble it's not that he's oh oh don't look at me I I you know I'm not no no it's pointed ahead to the fact that he's coming to suffer that's what he's going to do. And yeah. that's why he's on the back of a donkey. That's why he's not on a war horse here, because he ain't coming to conquer at least the way you understand conquering, but he's going to humble himself on a cross. I think the Bible says that, doesn't he? He humbled himself. Uh, and just so people know, that's the word here. It's not talking about an attitude of heart. It's talking about something that, that happens. Uh, and, and why I, I rejoice in that, because it happens to us. Uh, it happened yeah. to me. My my son's home, his apartment building burnt down, and all of a sudden, wait a second, everything was nice and settled, and now you're living with us, and we don't know where you're going to be living. And when we see wow. that, we think, oh, my goodness, what's going on? Doesn't God love me? And, of course, if you pay attention to the Bible, of course he loves you. This is just the world we live in. There's all kinds of things that happen worse than this could happen, you know. Uh, I look yeah. at his experience, and he really kept all of his personal belongings. That that was a key thing. He's got his life. Everybody got out of the apartment safe. Uh, yeah. wow. So it's not bad, though. The humble is yeah. not bad, uh, especially no. when you know that God is going to raise Jesus up. In the end, he'll raise us up, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, you raise, and you raise a good point that I think it's one that we've seen um, several times, and, and that really you just see throughout, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, that we have a tendency when we, especially when we translate these things into English, um, 
it's not necessarily even the matter of the language as much as maybe the culture that the language is in. We kind of emotionalize and yeah. um, psychologize all these words. Like you, you see that with love and oh, hate yeah, um, that, yeah. we, that we make it always about the emotions, right? Um, and, and similarly with humble, right? Uh, you, you make a good point that, I mean, re- really the word, if you kind of look at it, it can, it, re- it really kind of means like a poor or like wretched condition exactly right? like yes. bad shabby yes. right it's it's not an it's not an emotional psychology word but like a oh look at that i mean you, you know like like this is uh this is this is humble like this is uh you know when, when this is not like when someone politely says like you know welcome to my humble abode um but this is this is when rather you know you look at that and you're like look, look at that you know a uh, humble shack over there that hole in the wall right um so yeah it's it's a visible word, I think, um, to, to your point. And so that certainly would have been descriptive of the Lord Jesus, who had a, um, actually a humble appearance, though um, not because um, that was hiding a, a proud heart, but actually his heart was um, even humbler, really, um, yeah. than the appearance yeah. suggests. Yeah, the appearance but, reflected but, the, what but was yeah, inside. Yeah, that's right. Yes. There was harmony between the yeah. two. Yeah. No, yeah. That, that, that's, really, that's really good. That's really good. We shouldn't make it all about just um, the emotional stuff. There's, um, you know, about, uh, there's a certain thing about acting and actually putting it into action and, um, being visibly humble by aligning yourself with those who are poor and those who are suffering, right? Like, it's not just have like a certain attitude deep down inside and, you know, like, oh, it doesn't matter like how it looks on the outside. Like, well, no, God cares about what you actually do. Right. Yeah. Um, as yeah. well. So yeah, very, very, very helpful. All right. We're we're gonna do it. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get through <laughs> this middle section here. All right. So we just read. <clears throat> did we just read verse ten? I think. Yes. So. Yes. Yep. Okay. So here comes more blood. Uh, verse eleven. So as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double, for I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your son, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. And, All and, right. And, 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 you know, AJ, now see again, thank you for emphasizing the word blood, because I had not thought about that connection. So we start about blood being taken away from their mouths, right. and now all of a sudden we've got blood back. The problem with the first blood, it was their sacrifices. It was their things they were doing. They thought to appease the God and make the God do what they wanted the God to do. And now we have a different kind of blood entirely, a blood that is given. It is not. It is sacrifice, but we don't do the sacrifice. God does the sacrifice, and, and it is about a covenant. It's about God keeping promises that he made, see? Not, not that you've got to do something to get God to do what he's going to do, but no, God does what he does because he said he's what he's going to do. So he keeps his word. He keeps his promise. And, of course, blood of the covenant right away. You've got to be thinking Jesus, right? You've got to mm-hmm. be thinking, here, take a drink. This is my blood given for you. You know, uh, uh, yeah. the Jeremiah, you know, the blood that, that uh, uh, cleanses us from our iniquity. God will not remember our sins anymore. Uh, well, anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, no, certainly. I mean, like, just it, it's it's really striking. And, of course, it really just speaks to, you know, why this does show up in the, the lectionary, yeah. right? It's just, yeah. it's just perfect on Palm Sunday. We're just like, you know, here he comes, you know, on, on Palm Sunday, riding into Jerusalem, right? You know, Jerusalem and, and, and Zion. Um, mentioned like that in verse nine, the blood of the covenant in verse 11, you know, um, setting the prisoners free. I mean, it's just, it's just, it feels, wow, like this is perfect for Holy Week, basically, it is, right? It is. When, when you, when you look at it, um, the, and, and so that's not difficult to see. The, the, the difficult thing is to like, see how this fits with all the, the warrior stuff that's oh. on both sides of oh. this, right? Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. Because right there at the end of this middle section here, right, it's just, here we go again. Now, hang on a second. I thought we were kind of like done with war, <laughs> but for I have bent Judah as my bow and I've made Ephraim its arrow, right? And uh, against your sons, O Greece, right? So, I mean, uh, I mean, it's, it's just a very interesting picture because it, it's like, yes, it's like a parade of peace and it's like, you know, hooray, we don't have to be at war anymore, but it's, it seems like it's because the because we have won this big war and we've just, we've just conquered 
um, these people that seemed like they were unconquerable. I mean, and then like to even say like, you know, oh, oh, Greece, right? Like we're, um, though, I mean, I suppose, you know, I want to just check something in Hebrew though. I'm guessing that that's Javen. Yep. That's yes. Right. Yes. And it that's is the Javen. Yep, there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so you can't, um, <clears throat> you, you don't want to make assumptions like, oh, that, that means that, you know, Zechariah is predicting that they're going to, you know, conquer the Macedonian empire. Like you just, you just can't like start connecting things like that. And just because we call that Greece, I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> but what did it mean, doesn't to mean that that's what exactly. Zechariah is yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause then but, you're assuming that Zechariah has a vision of everything that's going to happen over the next few hundred years. Yeah. 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 yeah right. So, I mean, it's like, that's, uh, you know, let's, let's not like put words in his mouth. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely this idea that it's like the, the war is over and it's been won, which th isn't that an interesting way of thinking about the the triumphal entry? Yes, because because and this and this is of course always the the difficulty when you're thinking about the the first um, coming of our Lord Jesus that well hang on a second like everyone was expecting I mean even even as they're there and they're saying like Hosanna right that's not, and this is the thing that's kind of weird about it, right? Because we, we say that when we wave around the palm fronds and stuff on Palm Sunday. Uh, but when they were saying it, they didn't mean, you know, come forgive us our sins yeah, no. and, you know, cleanse us, you know, unto everlasting life. They, that's not what they meant. They, Save us from the meant, Romans. Yeah, that's right. They meant yeah. come, come be our king and take care of these guys, right? Like, oh, hey, look, this is Zechariah 9 coming to fruition. Oh, he's going to defeat um, all these Greek speaking peoples like the Romans, right? <laughs> so, um, I mean, and cause you know, even, even in Paul's day, they just referred to all these people as Greeks, right? Just yeah, kind of like a yeah. helpful Gentile word. Basically, yeah, they, they're right? not, they're not part of us. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, like, so, I mean, that's how they're taking it. They're looking at Zechariah 9 and saying like, oh, okay, right. So Jesus can come and defeat all these people. Um, but when he doesn't, it's like, hang on, how do you make sense then of this uh, triumphant we've we've conquered the world basically kind of image but you know what aj are you still yeah, there uh, um actually thanks to your comment it makes perfect sense to me now <laughs> oh okay <laughs> do, do go on well no no it, it, it does it, 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 it the image gets worse when we read the next verses about this war images and, and it tickles me because that was exactly my problem i i understand everything that's set up to this point it's basically saying that Jesus Christ is coming to save us. That's what he's going to do. Not just you, but he wants to save all nations. We le learned that. Uh, uh, I, I love the business about the prisoners, and we're going to be set free, although we're prisoners of hope, which means we don't have it now. We're still under the burden. We're still humbled, but but we will. But that's okay. We, we have the hope. But now it makes sense. So we see, here's the thing. Does this mean that we go back to our old practice of being uh, uh, appeasers? Uh, of living in syncretism, of just coexisting with all these other things? Oh, because now we have peace. No, no, that's not what the point is. We're going to go to war now. Onward, Christian soldiers. But we're not going to go to the way the war the way the world. We're not going to war with weapons, with swords, uh, with guns. No, we're going to go to war with the Word of God. That's going to be our weapon. We're going to go to war with love. And compassion, and again, as you said, not a warm feeling, but honest to God acts that bring blessing and care yeah. and help to people. So, actually, now thank you. It does make sense. It, it, God's saying, I, I'm, "I'm gonna have fun with you because you're thinking, you're thinking in terms of earthly war and battle, and you're earthly conquering, and that's not gonna happen. You're gonna find that out, but then you're gonna understand. My whole intent was, we're gonna conquer the world with my word." And it will be so strikingly different than the way the world conquers. Uh, anyway, that would be my thought. And I thank you for that inspiration. Uh, well, I thank you for introducing verses 14 through 17. Yes, so there aptly. you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, go ahead, let's go ahead and read those then. So this description of going, marching off to war here, picking up verse 14. Then the Lord will appear over them. And his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts will protect them and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones and they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine and be full like a bowl drenched like the corners of the altar. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people for like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. For how great is his goodness and how great his beauty 
grain shall make the young men flourish, and new wine the young women. And and I think you can understand why that's that's those are just difficult, difficult images. I mean, yeah, it, I, yeah, it sounds like an exuberant celebration <laughs> post-war, right? Like it, you've taken the booty and the spoils, and we're like going to drink wine and have a big party because we just we just totally you know wiped them out. <laughs> Right. That's exactly how it sounds. And yeah. and yet in the middle of that, there's this crystal clear verse. See, that's I, sometimes I think God makes things obscure so that the, the, the plain things are all the more plain. Because in the middle of that language, which I'm thinking, really, are we going to have this drunken, is that what we're going to be doing? But, but <laughs> on that day, the Lord their God will save them, okay, as the flock of his people, uh, like the jewels of a crown. That's pretty clear. I understand that. That, mm-hmm. that he's going to save you and me and everybody that's listening to us. Uh, the other things, I don't know about the new wine and the young women. and the, I don't know. I'm not sure. Although I think you <laughs> crystallize it. Uh, AJ, honest yeah. to God, you have crystallized this. Right? This is the way the world celebrates. We have a big drunken party. That's what we do to right. celebrate. You know, my Kansas City Chiefs, I, I might point oh out to gosh. you. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet there was a lot of drunken parties in Kansas City that uh, night they won the Super Bowl. And sure. so God's kind of making fun of that. Yeah, this is how the world celebrates. That's not how we're going to celebrate, but we are going to have the victory, and we're going to have reason well, to rejoice. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, so you got, you got to ask the question. All, all right, so so let, let's go ahead. I mean, because are you are you uh, a Forty like, Niners what? fan, AJ? I didn't oh, mean oh to rub goodness. it in. No, no, no. Okay, it's, all right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was just surprised that you were still talking about the Chiefs. Oh, I mean, of it's course. It's kind of been like a little bit of time. Here, I, I right? know, but, but we'll be talking just, about it until next oh football goodness. season. Oh, Seriously, oh, this is the, it's, we right. waited fifty years, AJ. Come on. All, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. I'll give you. I'll give you that. All right. So we only we only got a minute here. All right. Um, so just kind of connecting the dots here and, and kind of trying to look at, look at this as a whole. So to, to your point, it is difficult really to look at this in terms of like, how does this really get fulfilled yeah. on a historical level? Because you, you don't really have, I mean, like when, you, when you're looking here at this uh, situation where they're here with Zerubbabel and Joshua, son of Jehozadak, right? Th- there doesn't really seem to be a situation where they're going to go and like just conquer everybody and have a kingdom except for in one situation um which seems to be the case with the maccabees and so you actually get a limited um fulfillment of this because there they go um, and they march against guys which i think you could rightly describe as sons of javan in a kind of greek sense i mean they were very certainly hellenistic so you actually do have um, a situation where it's like that right and you do have a big celebration probably with a decent amount of wine uh, but the thing is that that was so fleeting. It was wiped out by the Romans just not long at all. It was just ephemeron. It was just like a like a morning dew, and it was gone. So wh- where is the real fulfillment of this? Where where is this perpetual peace that's promised? It's as you were saying, it's a hidden one that comes in Jesus, where his defeat and his conquering took place while he was actually conquering the demons and casting out the forces of darkness that are unseen to human eyes, which are so preoccupied on the visible things and the shiny things. And then he goes to war, as you were saying, with his word, which conquers the earth. So uh, the the, the immediate physical uh, manifestation with the Maccabees is is just, that's not the thing to focus on. It's as you were saying, it's the Lord Jesus and his word. And there is a big party with lots of wine, uh, and we call that the Eucharist, right? And the foretaste of the feast to come that we celebrate now every Sunday, uh, but that we will celebrate in all of its fullness on that last glorious day. So that was as fast as I could go with the fact that we have no time left. So, <laughs> Well, thanks. It was fun again, AJ. <laughs> yes. Th- thank you, Brother John. I, I always appreciate having you on. God bless. Everybody, that was Pastor John Lukomsky, uh, pastor in Southern Illinois, looking at Zechariah chapter 9 today. Thanks for tuning in. Moving on to Zechariah chapter 10. Until then, I'm Pastor AJ Espinosa. Peace. You've been listening to Thy Strong Word, produced by the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Office of National Mission in cooperation with Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the LCMS. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.